Hi everyone, my name is James. Welcome to King's Fine Woodworking. Today we're going to do two things with this video. I'm going to teach you step by step exactly how to build this new style of Adirondack chair, which I've put together. And I'm going to tell you all the steps that I took in order to make money and how to succeed in making money uh, doing woodworking as a business. I thought it would be a lot more interesting for everybody to have this information wrapped up into a build video as opposed to just a list of saying do this and do that. And the truth is outdoor furniture is really one of the very best ways to make money doing woodworking and probably the, the cream of the crop there is the Adirondack chair. I have probably made, I don't know, somewhere between 500 and 1000 of these things and they're just extremely popular and there's so much that you can do with them. It's kind of amazing and hopefully I can cover all that in this video today. On top of that, I've designed these to be as comfortable as I can get an Adirondack chair. There are compound curves, you know, the back curves one way with arch support, curves the other way to generate a, a gentle curve. Um, the, the legs taper together. So there's a lot of features built into this that really make it comfortable. And on top of that, it's actually fairly easy to build. Another cool thing is that changing the thickness of the lumber doesn't change the plans. Whether you use inch and a half thick dimensional lumber or three quarter inch oak or walnut, everything stays the same. So the easiest way to tackle a project like this is if you have a template. Now I've got a couple of things available. <clears throat> if you're interested in building this chair, you can buy a set of plans and you can build everything from that. The plans contain a grid with all the detailed measurements and you can mock that up, scale it up to full size to get the uh, plan itself or you can also pick up a set of this rolled paper template that I will offer and it's, it's printed on cardstock, pretty thick stuff and it just makes it easy because everything is already scaled to the exact size needed to build this project. So this is how I'm going to approach the build with the paper templates here and I just took a moment, used scissors and I'm going to cut all of the parts out. I like to cut them out so that I can still just see the black line, that way I know I have it pretty accurate. Fortunately this type of a design is pretty forgiving and if you're not spot on the chair will still go together okay without really any problems. So it really just takes a couple of minutes to cut all of the pieces for this plan out. It actually comes rolled up in a cardboard tube so nothing's actually folded or creased and it uh, makes it a little bit easier to draw. So we'll just take the plan itself, we'll put it on a piece of 2x6 and this is the arm. The arm is designed to fit uh, to the exact width of a 2x6. If you end up getting an oddball 2x6 that's a little bit narrower, that really won't make any difference. Uh, you just put it on there as best it, that you can and everything will work out fine. And I like to use a sharpie to trace these out or an ink pen, something that uh, where I can clearly see the dark line. And that's it. We just take that now, that traced part, over to the bandsaw and we'll cut it out. If you don't have a bandsaw, don't panic. I'm going to show you how to build this project without a bandsaw. In fact, I'm going to show you how to build the project with just some extremely basic tools. You can do this whole thing with a drill, a jigsaw, and a sander. And it's really that easy. It doesn't take very much stuff. If you have a bandsaw, it does make it a little bit faster, but it's not necessarily any less accurate. Once we're done bandsawing apart, we need to sand it. And I want you to notice I'm using 80 grit sandpaper here. That might seem really aggressive, but that's exactly what you need for outdoor furniture, especially this. Now there are some grooves and some cuts that made it very rough from the bandsaw, but with 80 grit, it takes it off almost right away. And if you have a rough spot, like at the corner that's not doing it, I'll go to 36 grit and a belt sander. Just hold it very lightly and sand back and forth very lightly. Keep long strokes and you're going to get nice even contours. That's the secret. You got to get nice even contours, long strokes, and really aggressive sandpaper. So many times I tell you I've seen people do projects like this and they leave rough spots or uneven spots and they just don't sand them out and it really doesn't look good. That's really the difference between a finish that looks professional, you know, the job looks professional, and a job that just looks like it was done by an amateur, is the amount of sanding effort that you put into a project. Okay, so now that we're done sanding, we're going to router. We're going to router to the top of the armrest here, all the way around. We'll leave the bottom unrouted, and that's how we can tell the top from the bottom. And you can see this relatively ugly piece of wood that we started with is actually starting to look really good now. And then I want to go over and sand the rough spots on the top as well and just make sure we get a decent finish overall. Another reason to use this 80 grit sandpaper is that it really helps absorb the oil finish we're going to put into it later. And there it is. 
Now let's talk about something else. Let's say that you want to make lots of these. You've made one or two. It turns out you're making money at it and you don't want to keep using these paper templates. I wouldn't either. What the first thing I do when I buy a project I know I'm going to make multiples of is I make a plywood template. And so I'll take these individual pieces, I'll place them down on the plywood, I'll trace them out, and I'll make the part just like I would have on the actual piece of wood itself. I like to use plywood. It's really durable and it will stand up to lots and lots of uses. So I'm going to go ahead and make a comprehensive set of plywood templates for this. And I'm also going to do one thing. I'm going to give away this set of plywood templates after this uh, video here. So if you leave a comment in the description below if you're interested in the plywood templates that I have made, I'm going to give away a set of them and I'll select a, a winner at random and I'll mail them to you. I'm also using Baltic birch plywood, so these things should last forever. There's no voids in them. They should last a good long time. So I've got this outer contour here, a little bit rough from the bandsaw, and you can see I've left the black mark. So I'm just going to take long, even strokes with my belt sander, and I have 36 grit on the belt sander. And I'm just going to keep sanding until I get right down to about midpoint on the thickness of that black line. And then I know my cut is absolutely perfect all the way. Now that might be a little bit too rough, for a nice pencil line, no big deal. I'll follow that up with my random orbit sander. And I've got 80 grit on this, and you could make this even a little smoother if you want, since this is gonna be a permanent template that you're gonna use for everything. Then I'll take just a second to sand off the lines from the front of this and get it smooth all the way around, and that's it. This is a completed template, wooden template that we have from the paper template. And you can see all I did was take my time, and it's absolutely perfect. And there we have it. I've cut out all the paper templates, and from each of those I have made a wooden template for each of the curved parts on the chair. I'm going to go ahead and label these. And this is what we can use to build the whole project from. And I'm going to give this set away. Actually, I'm going to give away a brand new unused set. Uh, to somebody in the description below. Uh, just leave a comment saying that you're interested in having it, and uh, I'll send it to you. Okay, so here's what we're going to do now. I'm going to go ahead and make one with a jigsaw. Uh, a lot of people don't have bandsaws out there, and so I want to show you how to do this and show you that it's actually pretty easy to do it without a lot of expensive stationary machinery. In fact, a product like an Adirondack chair is a wonderful project to get into the business of woodworking with, and the reason is because you can make about 300 bucks profit on a chair, three to 400 really, depending on what part of the country that you live in. I sell these here for between four and 500 depending on what species of wood they're made from, and I spend anywhere from 80 to 100 bucks for the wood. So you can easily make three to 400 dollars profit on a chair. You uh, go out there and you sell two of these chairs, and you just take the profit and buy yourself a bandsaw. Then you can sell uh, three or four more chairs, and you can buy yourself another piece of stationary equipment. So you can very easily build up your shop tool set just by doing projects like this. And you know, it's not uncommon at all to do four chairs, six or even eight chairs for a client. Uh, people get these, they love them, they talk to their friends and neighbors, and your, your client list just grows. I've helped a number of people over the years start woodworking businesses, and what I recommend that they do is they take the profits from each job, and they split the profits in half. They can use half to live on, and then they turn around and invest the other half into their shop. Because clearly, it is a little bit slower if you're going to cut these out with a jigsaw versus a bandsaw. Not much, but it is a little bit slower. So if you've got stacks of chairs that you have to get delivered, say 8, 10, or 12 chairs, and you can cut these pieces on a bandsaw, it's certainly going to make things faster. So what I always suggest is you take about half the money, use it for your expenses, take the other half and invest in things like a bandsaw. And then before you know it, you'll have a shop full of tools. Okay, so that's all done, and you see, this was a terrible cut. I didn't notice it till the end, uh, but my table there, the lock had come undone, and so my blade started tilting sideways a little bit, but you know what? It doesn't make any difference at all. I've cut my cut just a little bit bigger than the line, and we're gonna sand this down, and this piece is going to be perfect. I've got 36 grit on the belt sander. I'm gonna hold it lightly, and I'm just gonna make long, even strokes. Don't try to just sand down the areas that are rough. Sand the whole thing down, to maintain long, even strokes. That keeps a perfectly uniform curve. All the time I see people try to just hit the rough spots. Don't do that. Always hit long strokes to get everything uniformly smooth. 
which is what I've done here. Then we're going to follow up with the uh, random orbit sander with an 80 grit. Same thing. Do long, even strokes. Follow the compound, the contours of that curve with long, even strokes. And you can see it's turning into a perfect radius. Now we've got some edge chip up there, but guess what? It doesn't actually matter for this project because I'll sand the top down a little bit and then we're going to hit it with a router because this is a seat slat. This is actually the far back seat slat and the edges of it have to be routed. But even the sander went a long ways to clear this up. And now we're going to route it. I use a 3 8 inch radius roundover bit, by the way, for this project. <clears throat> if I had wood that was a little bit thinner, like 3 quarter inch wood, hardwood from a, from a, a hardwood dealer as opposed to wood from the big box door, I might use a quarter inch radius roundover. But that's really all just kind of a matter of personal taste. And you can see this piece, this curve, everything, it actually looks perfect. It doesn't look like there's anything wrong with it, and it was really aggressively cut on a bandsaw. I'm sorry, on, a, on my jigsaw. It was a cheap jigsaw with a cheap blade, and the table was tilting. But consider all that, and then consider the care that I took in sanding it, and I did this whole thing in real time. In two minutes, we've got a piece. And that's really all there is to it. You can easily cut all the pieces that would be required for two chairs in a day using just a jigsaw. And there we have the completed piece, all set. Now we're gonna move on to some mass production. I'm gonna build these as a set. We're gonna make four chairs uh, for this customer. And the first thing that I would do is I would take all of the pieces that I have and cut them to approximate length. That would allow me to go through and trace all of them and then followed by, of course, cutting them out with either the jigsaw or the bandsaw. And there's all the cedar. I've decided that I'm gonna use cedar for the top and I'm going to use redwood for the bottom. So the seat back, the seat that you sit on, and the tops of the armrests, those are all cedar, and the remainder of the chair is redwood. It gives kind of a nice two-tone effect. Here we're cutting some redwood. I'm cutting these to length to make the back legs. The back legs are a little bit wider than a 2x6, and so we can get a pair of back legs from a short length of 2x12. And I'll just kind of show you here. We'll fit the paper template on and, and just have a look and you can see that two pieces will fit on. It's always nice if you can position them in such a way to avoid knots. Uh, if you can't, you can't, but you don't want any giant knots with holes, you know, in any structural pieces. And uh, this is a back slat that I made, I've cut out, and I wanted to illustrate this uh, sanding technique one more time. Of course, we're going to use 80 grit to start, which is what I really like to do with outdoor furniture. It gives maximum oil penetration. And what you do not want to do is take your sander and hold it on an edge and grind away at the spots that aren't perfect. You want to do long, continuous strokes over and over and over again. It might seem a little bit slower or weird to do it this way, but by doing this, you have a long, continuous curve. So many times I see people do this and they don't do that. They just try to hit the high spots and then you end up with a piece that doesn't have a continuous curve and then it looks like somebody made it at home in their garage as opposed to a professional piece. And you see it just took a few extra seconds and we have a continuous curve and it's done nicely. Now I'm going to cut the pieces out for the front legs. The front legs are just a vertical piece and you could actually get those out of a 2x4 if you want. I just bought 2x6s for everything because the little off cut, the narrower piece there, I'm going to use for one of the seat slats. So there really isn't any waste whether you choose 2x4 or 2x6. And if you get the plans, I'll have a comprehensive cut list and, and a cut pattern list for you as well to make it a little bit easier. Here's a quick look at all of the seat slats that we need for four of our chairs. And this is the back arch. This is like the upper back arch. It's a cradle type piece that's going to carry uh, the, sleet, the seats at the midpoint. And I've kind of made a darker mark on that corner. And I've raised my bandsaw to 30 degrees. I want to show you this is the only piece that needs this bevel cut. You can also do this with a jigsaw. Your uh, table on your jigsaw will, of course, go to 30 degrees, no problem. And you just follow that line. Follow it as closely as you can. If it's not perfect, it really doesn't matter. If you're a degree or two off, it really doesn't matter. You'll still have the majority of the back seat slat touch it, and that'll be just fine. Uh, if you have a bandsaw, once again, you know, this makes it just a little bit faster and a little bit more accurate in this case than a jigsaw will. But it's no problem. I've made dozens of these with just a jigsaw, and it works out great. 
Once that's done, we're just going to take this over and sand it. And you can see that angle profile there. It's a 30 degree profile. We'll take this over and we're going to sand it. And you got to remember, once again, long, even strokes. We never want to leave a burn mark and we never want to just sand on the spots that aren't perfect. We want long, continuous strokes to have a uniform inside surface. And you see how nicely that's cleaned that up? That was no problem at all to get that cleaned up. And we still have the majority of our line there. And I'll probably even sand those sharp edges a little bit to get rid of the, uh, the sharp corners. Here's a quick look at all of our pieces that have been cut. They haven't been routed yet, but they've all been cut out. And you can see what it looks like. It's all the redwood and all the cedar needed to make this chair. Or to make four chairs, I should say. Let's talk about the back. The back is shaped like the letter S, and it's important to know which side is front, which side is up, which side's down, that sort of thing. So put it so that one of the arches faces like this and measure from where the arch makes contact on one side to the point on the other, and you see that was about 28 inches. Flip it and check the other side from where it makes contact to the arch to where the end is, and that one's about 20 inches. So that's shorter. That makes the shorter section the, the arch support. And this will be the front of the arch support. I hope that made sense. You might have to go in and watch it one more time. And then the part to the right is the upper back. So now that we know that this is the front, we want to route it. A palm router works great for these and because it has a very small uh, uh, base, router base. And so it allows us to get the, uh, the point down a little bit more accurate and the curve look a little bit nicer. And so we're just going to route this all the way around. And it's just going to be routed on the front side only. I'm actually going to take the time to show you each piece and specifically where to route each piece so that you can have it done before you do assembly to maximize the look of the whole project once it's done. It's very hard to route these pieces once the chair has been assembled. Now I don't route the bottom, the curve on the bottom. You can see that there. I did route the curve across the top. That'll help us to remember what's the bottom. That's the bottom right there. It's straight. It'll help us to remember what's the bottom and what's the top. And the top, of course, is rounded over. Okay, so we're just going to route all of the seat slats the same way. Okay, this is the bracket that holds the seat. And we don't want to route the top and the back, which is what I was just showing there. We just want to route the front. But we want to route both sides of the front. Now, for all of these, I'm using a 3 8 inch radius round over bit. And if you wanted to use... Uh, smaller or larger uh, round over you probably could I just find this one looks really nice with this chair size and this wood thickness size and there we have that I missed a little bit right in the corner here there we go okay so that's the bracket okay next up we have the upper cradle this is the very top of the chair at the back and I'll show you here it kind of holds all of the top pieces together so that they don't warp or twist down the road and I'm going to turn around and we're going to do the outside of it so we're going to do the two ends and then we're going to do the back side not the inside of the curve which touches the slats but the outside and we're going to do both the top and we're going to do the bottom now all these pieces have already been sanded uh, it's best to sand them first to get these curves nice and uniform after cutting on the jigsaw and that way when we route the routing follows a nice clean straight line and now I'm routing the bottom side of this piece and we'll do that all the way around and remember we're going to leave the inside unrouted. I know this part of the video is just a little bit slow, but this will be important for anybody who wants to build this to know exactly where to route what pieces. <clears throat> okay, this is a seat slat. These are pretty easy. We're just going to pick the pretty side and put the pretty side up. And then we're just going to route the two sides, like the front and the back portion of it there. But just on just on one side, I guess, let me be specific. Just, just the top side of the seat slat, not the bottom. And there's no point in routing the two ends yet because this seat tapers back. It's wider at the front and narrower at the back. And we're going to cut those later. So we're just going to route the top two long sides and that's it. Okay, next is the very front component which holds the two rear legs together. It fits between the front legs and holds the two rear legs together and it's beveled there at uh, six degrees. And the only thing we're going to route on this is the bottom. This is also a great piece in order to put some engraving for your customer. 
Maybe you have a, a sign kit that you can buy for your router if you have a router and you can put those in. Or maybe you have a CNC machine, you could engrave that. That's always a big upsell. Sometimes I throw those in for free. All right, we'll take a look here how the seat slats go. And this the, the seats go, seat slat goes behind this last slat. This is the one piece that I made and showed you how to cut with the jigsaw. And this is the lower back cradle, the lower back portion, which holds the seat slats at the bottom. And I'm going to mark where this fits onto the, uh, onto the back legs themselves. I'm going to make a note here because where that intersects with the legs, I don't want to route that. I want that to stay nice and flat. So, And I've turned it upside down. I just want to route the portion between those two lines. That's going to make it look better. Might look a little funny if I route it over it because then the curve would kind of go down into the uh, the back leg itself. But if we keep this curve away from the back leg a little bit, it just looks a little bit nicer. So we're going to route the bottom between the two legs and flip it over. And we're going to route the top on both sides and the whole back. Because the top can be routed on all three of those sides there. But here again, we will not route the front portion of it, which comes into contact with the seat slats. Just the other stuff that doesn't come into contact with the seat slats. And that's how that's done. Okay, and so you already saw me do this one one time, <clears throat> but I have another piece here, which I will do. And this one is a seat slat, but it's the very back seat slat. That's why it's not straight. It has to fit the inside contour of the back of the chair, and that follows a gradual arch. And so this one we're going to route all the way around. The two sides, the left side and the right side, are already tapered at that six degrees, and they're already the right. It's already preset to be the right length. So this one itself will get routed all the way around, but top side only, not on the bottom. And then the seat slats will end up going in front of it, and they'll eventually get cut at that same taper. Well, I'll show you how to do that when we get to the assembly phase. Okay, now we have the front legs. The front legs have also a taper. They're tapered back at 5 degrees. And I want to make sure I put those tapers to the back. They go down to the back. And so I've marked a left leg and a right leg. Then I'm going to open them up and lay them flat. So this becomes the outside of the leg. That's how I've laid it down. And all we want to do is route the outside of the leg, not the inside. And we're just going to route the two long sides, and that's it. Not the top and not the bottom. I thought I'd take a minute and just say if you guys like my videos, uh, you like the content that you see, I'd really appreciate it if you click that subscribe button down below. That's how our channel grows and that really helps us out. And I'd also like to take a moment to say hi to everybody in our community. We have a woodworking community. It's called King's Fine Woodworking Community. It's on Facebook. And if you're interested in joining that, it's a great place to share your work and get help from others. And I'll put a link to that in the description down below. Thank you. Okay, so when I do route the uh, the legs themselves after I orient them, put them the correct side up and out, I make sure I always route a left side and a right side. It'll actually be the same thing with the arms. That way we don't get confused and, and have uh, all of them be left side pieces, for example. And so in order to follow that up with an example, we're going to take the arms. These are the two arms, and I'll do a left and a right. And I'm going to mark on them the top on both sides, and that's how I know which ones to route or which side to route. And the arm itself actually gets routed all the way around, top side only, but all the way around. Another thing that's good to point out is <clears throat> when we're going around these inside curves, uh, in order sometimes to prevent tear out, you do have to go backwards, maybe make a climb cut. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Just be aware when you're routing and route nice and slowly. And if you start to experience tear out, try going gently the other way, but just keep a firm grip on your router to prevent your router from running away from you. And if you have any experience with router, you're probably familiar with that. And if you do have a situation where you get burns, I think it's critical to sand those burns out. Okay, so now we're going to actually route that arch that we had to bevel. This is the middle back arch that the middle of the slats screw onto, and that's the one that was beveled on the bandsaw at 30 degrees. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the arms in place 
and I'm going to mark where they go. You can see how the arms fit perfectly there. I'm going to mark where they go because I don't want to route these where the arms are. I want the arms to stay nice and flat. So that's why I'm making a mark there. And much like we did the very bottom cradle, the lower one, the lower back support, um, I'm going to route between the lines for the top portion here. It's a kind of the kind of the reverse of what we did with the other cradle. With that one, I routed between the lines on the bottom portion. Here, I'm routing between the lines on the top portion. And it just looks a lot better if you do this. If you do make a mistake and route all the way around, there's really no harm, no structural harm. It just looks a little nicer if you can route it this way. Then I'm going to flip the piece over, like I did with the other cradle. And for this one, I'm going to route the two sides and the back. Same exact thing we did with the bottom, just in reverse. And one thing that we will not do is we will not route the front part of this cradle, the part that comes into contact with the back slats. We won't route over that piece. We'll leave that at its bevel angle, and that's all it needs. And there we go. That is the completed middle slat. And you can see now when I put this arm back on, it fits nice and flat where the two components meet, and then the round over starts some point slightly after that. That's what looks best. All right, now we have the back leg. That's the bottom part of the back leg. And I'm going to show you the areas that we're going to route. We're going to start right here at this corner. That's the corner where the lower back arch meets. We're going to start routing there. And we'll route around the back and then down To the bottom but we won't route across the base of the foot that touches the ground. We'll leave that square and then we'll route the whole bottom side of the leg. And then when that's done we're going to flip it over and do the exact same thing. We're going to start, well I guess we'll start at the bottom since uh, we're going to go left to right here, but we'll do the, the whole bottom side all the way across. But we do want to make sure we stop short and we don't route the bottom, the part that comes into contact with the bottom. And then we'll route the upper portion, the back and the upper portion, all the way up to that corner. And that corner is where the backmost cradle goes that holds the, uh, holds the back slats. And the rest of that stays unrouted. And that's all there is to it. And that's all of the pieces. So. I went ahead and finished the rest of them, and this is the entire collection of pieces that have been sanded and routed and ready for assembly for four chairs. Now I put this together in about two days, so it's not too long to put together. Uh, I took about an extra day to film it and film the components as I went along, but that's basically it. Now since these are outdoor pieces, I think it's very important to finish them before assembly. This is Pinafin. This is a penetrating oil finish. It's made of Brazilian rosewood oil. It's probably one of the best finishes I've ever used. This one's transparent cedar in color. And I'm going to use the cedar color for all the upper portions of the chair, which are cedar. And I have another one for the redwood. But this stuff is just fantastic, and I think it's important to um, put this finish on before you assemble the chair because that way you have finish in between all the areas where the wood would ordinarily make contact. And I put this on pretty liberally here. I leave it on fairly thick. I let it sit for about a half an hour, and I use a clean towel, and I go back over it, and I wipe off the excess. And this stuff lasts a long time. It lasts five or six years easily without needing any finish. And this is Pinafin for Redwood. This makes even construction grade Redwood, the stuff with sapwood in it, look red. And I think it's it's just, it's really good stuff. I've been using Pinafin for a long time. You can of course use anything you like. Uh, but I, th I do think it's important to get a good finish and a good seal on all the pieces of wood before you take them outdoors or before you assemble it. Um, since they're going to live outdoors, you know, they're going to be exposed to the elements, to the water, to the sun. Now, the sun's really the most destructive thing. The ultraviolet rays of the sun are what really attacks the wood, causes the aging, the oxidation, more than the rain and stuff like that. And so it's just, it's good to get a good quality finish on. And that's it. So I've got all the pieces laid out here to dry. And after they dried about 30 minutes, we went over them and we wiped off the excess oil with a rag. And in reality, there was almost nothing to wipe off when it's all done. 
Okay, so now we're gonna move into the assembly phase and I'll show you step by step how this is done. We're gonna start with this front piece. <clears throat> that's a front piece of wood that's already tapered at uh, six degrees because that's how the two back legs will slope together. And we're gonna put that on there. But one thing before we do, when we cut the legs out, we cut the legs square. And that's how I typically do it. And then I just make a note of how I wanna trim that leg to take it to the six degree angle. And this is important, you wanna get this as close as you can. You can do this with your circular saw, you could do it with a jigsaw, you could sand that bevel angle into it. I like to take it over to the chop saw. Got the chop saw set at six degrees. If someone helps me hold it up there, I don't need to put a prop in. And I wanna cut off just barely enough wood to do that. Then I've gotta flip the saw over to six degrees on the other side, because remember these cuts are opposite of one another. We've got a left side and a right side. And here again, we want to cut off just barely enough wood to get that six degree bevel cut. I don't want to take any actual length off of this. I want the cuts to come right to the corner. When that's done, don't forget, you got to get back over and refinish these end grains. Uh, it's important that the end grain doesn't stay exposed, even though you're going to have wood in front of it. You know, we really want this, this chair to last forever. And I dive chairs in my backyard that have been there for 30 years because I finished them really good to begin with. And that's what's important. Okay, so to start, we're just gonna go to one of the two corners. And a long squeeze clamp is handy here. If you're working by yourself in the shop, that might be the only way to do it. Um, you could, uh, if you had a pin nailer, you could drive in a couple of pin nails first, which would hold it there, or I mean finish nails, to hold it steady. And I like to tap it, I like to get it as perfect as I can get it. I use a little squeeze clamp up top to hold it vertically the same. And then I will pre-drill drill a hole in there first before we put the screw in. If you don't previously have a previously drilled hole before putting a screw, you're gonna split the wood. And I'll show you shortly, there's gonna be some other cases where we have to do a little more than just that standard pre-drill. And we're gonna tap the bottom in nice and straight because I want everything to fit perfectly as I can, as perfectly as I can to get the assembly going. And we'll do the same thing down here. We'll drill a hole first. And a good countersink bit works great. Uh, it's not perfect for everything. We'll talk about that again in just a second. And I'm using a deck screw. This is a Deckmate deck screw. Prime Guard makes them as well. Um, an exterior deck screw. These are ceramic coated. They'll last forever outside. I use a combination of three inch and two and a half inch. I've got three inches here. Anywhere I'm going into the end grain of the wood or anywhere my joint is long enough for me to use a three inch, I will. If I'm just doing uh, attaching two one and a half inch pieces together, I'll do a two and a half so I don't take any risk of poking through. So that's it. The two sides are, uh, are screwed into the front there. Now we're gonna put this lower back cradle piece and it's a good idea to note where it goes. So this joint right here, that's the back edge and that's where the back edge of the cradle piece goes and it should be flush along the back leg. And this cradle piece is tapered at six degrees so it's gonna match the taper of the legs. If it doesn't, force it to match a little bit. It's possible you didn't cut the front perfectly, so force it to match. Pre-drill pre it and screw it and you're good to go. All right, that's that part. Now we wanna assemble the front legs. Now I've created a little jig here. This is real simple. This little jig brings this up at just the right height to get my chair up uh, to 14 and a half inches. So 14 and a half inches because I'm not including the top slat. That'll give me a 16 inch seat height when the, when the slat gets into place. I just took two pieces of pine, put them together. All right, let's look at these. The legs, the taper is important where they go. They have to taper to the back. You don't want to put these in backwards and then screw and bolt them in because then you're going to have to cut new ones. And they do angle because they have to fit flush to these back legs. And you need some squeeze clamps to hold these in place for you. And then I want to tap them if need be. And you, of course, have to have one of these Thor's Hammer woodworking mallets. Otherwise, it can't be done. We do sell these, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and then I also have plans for you to make one if you're interested. But I want a nice flush fit here. It's important during the assembly phase you get everything as flush as you can. And if you have a square, any square works. I'll put a link to these Kynex squares. They're stainless steel squares. They're actually pretty cheap, like $12 or $15 a square. They're quarter-inch thick steel, and they're great for squaring things. 
So you can build this chair on like your table saw, your assembly table, or if you have a really flat patch of concrete somewhere that's that you know is level and flat, you can do that. And I like to go ahead and square both of these up. That way I know these legs are truly vertical. And the more uh, time that I take in getting all this stuff set up just right, the nicer my chair will come out in the end. It's important to take a lot of time for these steps at, at, uh, at this stage. And we're going to do a final check once again here on our height and make sure I didn't change anything inadvertently. And I didn't. They're both 14 and a half perfectly. And so that's great. Now we'll start by drilling a countersink in. This is only going to go in the front edge of this front leg and it's going to go into that cross bracket, the one engraved with the name. And just a single screw there is all that's needed. This front part of the seat isn't actually going to carry much weight. It's just there to uh, um, provide structural support and spacing more than anything else. The legs themselves are what carry the bulk of the weight going straight down the back legs that are tied into the front legs and for that reason we're going to use bolts. I'm going to use carriage bolts. Now you could get away with screws here there wouldn't be any problem to put two or three of those uh, say two and a half inch deck screws that would be plenty fine but if you get somebody over there like me who's 400 pounds somebody heavy and they plop down in the chair repeatedly you know I'd be worried about the longevity of it and so if you know it's my own personal chair um, you're making it for yourself, you know you're going to be careful. Uh, but if you're making it for a client, you know you really want to make it really, really heavy duty. So I would invest a little bit of money and put it together with bolts at this point. This is a 3 8 inch hot dipped galvanized bolt. You could use zinc. Zinc will last a long time outside. But I spent a few cents extra and got hot dipped galvanized. I know it's never going to rust or corrode. And then we're going to bolt that in tight. And I'll use a pair, I'll use one high and one low for maximum strength. I know it's a little bit overkill for this project. Uh, typically when I do projects, however, I guarantee them for life uh, against any you know, uh, workmanship issues. So I, I t tend to overbuild everything. I don't really want somebody coming back and saying I did a poor job. So I try to make everything as good as I can and as strong as I can. Um, and if it costs an extra few dollars to put in some bolts, I think that's not not a problem. So there you see, we got the bolts all in place, snugged up, and so that's a pretty rock solid chair at this point. Okay, so before I set this on the ground to continue the build, I'm going to just put in another little temporary piece of wood uh, that's just going to kind of help me with the assembly. This is a little piece of just three quarter inch pine that I had. I cut a similar arch just real roughly and I put got some inch and five eighths screws, just a pair of them. I'm going to hold that there and this is just going to act as a lip that's going to hold my back slats while I'm putting them in place so I don't have to hold each one individually and they stay nice and even. Now the ones that go on each corner those will hold themselves in place because the legs are there so that won't be a problem. So let's start on the far left side here. What I want to do is I want to line that up flush right out to the very edge and it of course has to tilt in because it's got to be uh, meeting flush at the back with that back cradle arch piece, but I want my drill to go in straight. So my drill hole is actually going diagonally through this piece of wood, and that's no problem. And there's, this is what I was talking about before. This is a little bit bigger of a drill bit because a typical countersink bit still is a little too small for most screws. And I don't want this screw to be hitting any interference going through the first piece of wood. I want it to only screw into the second piece of wood. If it screws into the first piece of wood and stretches it, it might crack it. And I don't want to take the time to cut another back cradle. Or not cradle, I'm sorry, another back slat. Okay, so now I've marked the very center of that back cradle and I've marked the very center of the slat. So I'm going to put in the middle slat. So same thing, I'm going to drill it first with my countersink. And I know that this countersink, like most countersinks I have, are just a little too small. So I'm using a bigger bit to go just through that piece of wood only. That's going to take all the tension and pressure off of that piece of wood, so there's no chance that this screw will crack it. And then I'll go ahead and sink the screw in fully. 
And if you take the time to do that, it's like an extra 10 seconds for each piece, <clears throat> each piece that's critical, it's going to make a big difference. All right, and you can see that that uh, little piece of wood that we put in there is really helping us to support everything. So we'll put in now five on the left-hand side, and I'm going to space them evenly. It's good if, you, if you're if you just by yourself, just put one at a time. But if you've got somebody there to help you, like my daughter Sai is here helping me, I'll just kind of space them out roughly at the bottom equally. I don't want to bother cutting spacers because I can sight them. They're all really, really close together. And I'll drill with the countersink. Then I'll drill with the little bit wider bit. Now the diameter of that wider bit needs to be the same as the outside of the threads on your screw. You can kind of hold them up to each other and visually verify that that's what they are. All right, and we'll go on to the next one. Same thing. We're going to get an estimate on the width and countersink, then the wider drill bit, and then sink the screw. It's going to be the same sequence all the way across. We're going to utilize this method for the back slats and I'm going to use this method for the seat slats too. That helps a lot when you're drilling right near the edge and screwing right near the edge of a piece of wood, like right near the end. All right, so I've got this little template I made. It's two inches by one inch. Um, it's just a little jig to kind of help me measure. Um, now I want to set it up so that the middle of my armrest comes up flush to the front as the middle of the armrest, flush to the front, just eyeball it. And then on the side, we just want to meet at the side. Not real critical, and I'll show you again when we hit to the other side. I'm going to hold it steady. We'll do a countersink, and then we'll put in a screw. Now, I don't need that other bit here to make it a wider hole because I'm pretty far away from the edge. I'm not really worried about this splitting. Plus, it's a really wide board, a little bit less likely to split. And we'll put that in. That's the only screw we're going to put in for now for our arm. All right, same thing on the other side. We're going to put the arm in place. We're going to take our 2 inch by 1 inch jig, hold it up flush against the arm. It's flush against the arm on the inside. And you notice it can, I can pivot it up or down if need be. I have to pivot it up a little because this arm actually tilts 5 degrees down to the back. And I want the middle of the arm to line up flush with the front of this piece of wood. You see, because it's at an angle, it's not going to line up the whole way. It's just going to line up in the middle. That's it. And then on the left-hand side, the widest, furthest out point needs to be out to the one-inch mark. That's it. Hold it in place. Drill one hole with a countersink. This hole should be towards the front of your leg, because we are going to put another hole a little closer towards the back of that front leg. And then sink the screw. Now, this should be a three-inch screw since we're going in uh, into some end grain there. All right, cool. So that's going to hold that temporarily while we swing around and work on the back. You see how it pivots in and out? We've got a, the ability to move it a little bit to make sure this fits. All right, here's that uh, middle back cradle that we cut the bevel on on the bandsaw. And it, you see it's a little big, doesn't quite fit. No big deal. We're just going to wiggle those arms in and out and make it fit perfectly. Here, here again, we need to use some squeeze clamps to kind of hold it in place. And we do want this to be perfect. If it's not perfect, you need to kind of force it, make it perfect. You need, If you need to stretch it in or out or whatever, just get it as neat as you can because that's how the design goes together. The design goes so that these actually fit perfectly. If you've cut your pieces not quite perfect, that's okay. They don't have to be flawless. But if you've cut them pretty well, then these should line up perfectly. And we'll clamp it and hold it in place. And look, see how we have this wiggle here? So the whole structure can actually move left to right. So I'm going to demonstrate that here. It has a lot of movement in it, so we don't. We want to know uh, that it's in the center. Here's how we'll do it. We're going to take a chalk line or a string line or a plumb bob, anything you have, and hold it straight down. Don't let it touch the ground, and we're going to measure. So she's measuring the distance from that side straight over to the chair, from the string straight over to the closest part on the leg. And we'll, we'll do the same thing on the other arm. We're going to measure at the same point on the arm, the, the back corner of the arm, and right over to the leg. And then I had to adjust it a little bit there because it didn't quite fit. And we'll measure it again and see if that's accurate. And if we think it's right, we'll check it again on the other side. This is another one of those times where it pays to take your, take your time and let's get it set up just right. 
All right, so we'll check it again over here. And we'll try to adjust it and get it perfect. I think I went too much the wrong direction there. Three quarters. Okay. I think we ended up with like five and three quarters on both sides. And yours might be the same. Yours might be a tiny bit different. It doesn't really matter as long as they're both equal. If they're equal, you know your arms are centered. Once they're centered, we're going to go ahead and bolt them. I'm going to use the same thing, a 3 8 inch bolt. And the same thing applies here. I could, if I wanted to, put in three or four deck screws. I don't think there's a problem with that. But if I were doing this for a client, I would go ahead and use carriage bolts. I just want it really strong. Maybe they're going to climb on the chair. Maybe they're going to have their kids roughhousing or, you know, kids are going to, they got teenagers, they're going to play a football and tackle into the chair. I don't know. We, I want the chair to be strong. So that's why I'm going to bolt it together. And before we put in the second bolt, that's why it was important to know that, they were, that the thing was centered left to right. But it was, so we can go ahead and put in the second bolt. No problem. And you notice I'm kind of supporting the cradle with my hand and sigh as supporting it there also. Because we only have one screw in the front arm. So we don't want it to, to bend too much. And we have to tap that carriage bolt down so that the square part of the carriage bolt digs into the wood. But we got to support that while we do that so we don't tear the screw out of the front part of the arm that goes down into the leg. And then we'll just tighten that up. And that's that side. We'll do the same thing on the other side and that part's complete. Now we'll start putting the back slats into the middle cradle, the middle back arch and so we'll move it I, what I did here is I actually moved it all the way to the right and that's not not the right way to do it it should be about a quarter of an inch away from all the way to the right it will work you'll just have to kind of squeeze these back slats back together at the top for the upper back cradle but if you leave about a quarter inch gap away from that outermost edge away from the arm uh, you'll find it a little bit easier to put together so I contemplated remaking this section for the video but I figured I can explain that all right, then I'm going to put the middle one in. I'm going to, I roughly separated them all equally by sight. And then I put the middle one in. And then we'll just kind of proceed in that fashion. We'll move, move around and get them centered by sight. We'll put the countersink in. And then we'll put a screw in. Now, also, you notice these slats have warped just a tiny bit from when they were cut. And they're not actually fitting back really tight to the back, which is no big deal. We'll just push them back and screw them in snug. They could warp back, they could warp forward or left or right, just a tiny bit, which is normal. When you cut a piece of wood, it can change shape a little bit, but that's no problem at all. So that's it. We've got all of those in, all the way across, and that's secure. Now we'll go ahead and remove this bottom shelf piece that we put in to hold the slats at the right elevation. We no longer need that. That was just there to help us with alignment and assembly purposes. Okay, now before proceeding to do any more with the back, I'd like to put in these little brackets. Now these brackets aren't gonna actually sit straight on the vertical leg, and the reason is because the top arm slopes backwards, and that's totally fine. You could always taper the top part of the bracket down to five degrees so that it does fit vertically up and down, but the little five degree taper on there means it slants a little, but it still looks great. I don't think there's any issue at all. So we'll just put this in, we'll pre-drill it the same way we did with uh, everything else and put, put screws in. I'm just putting two and a half inch screws in here, not really long ones. I don't think long ones are needed. This just gives the arm a little more strength, a little more rack resistance. And you see I do have a second screw in the uh, arm going down into the vertical leg and then of course a screw at the top going into the bracket as well. And that secures the arm. We'll do the same thing to the other side. And now we've got a, a rock solid arm up front. And that's how the bracket looks. You can see it's tilting slightly forward. I think that looks just fine. And here's the back cradle. So you can see the back cradle doesn't quite reach from edge to edge. No big deal. Part of it's because these um, back slats I cut are splayed out a little bit 
from from changing shape and part of it's because I spread them really far all the way out to the arms uh, so I'll just squeeze them in a little bit when I put this in and I'm going to put the middle one in first we'll measure and I'll put the clamp and we'll pre-drill and put the middle one in now I have a lot of drill holes going into this back cradle this upper back cradle so for some of these I am going to go ahead and do the pre-drill and then I'm going to use the slightly bigger drill bit uh, in order to take some uh, uh, tension off of this back piece so it doesn't end up checking on me. <clears throat> I don't want to take, you know, 15 minutes and stop and cut another back cradle out. That could always happen. And then we're going to go ahead and space these all individually by sight all the way across and then screw them in. This is the bigger bit that I was talking about. It just uh, will prevent this thing from splitting since we have so many screws in such short distance. And you can see it only goes through the cradle part itself. It doesn't go into the slat. And we're far enough down on this slat. This is about two inches down from the top of the slat. The exact distance isn't critical, but you, you, I just put mine about two inches down. You can put yours how you see fit, but if you stayed about this height, then that's probably the safest. It keeps these tops from warping over time, which they might if you have a lot of varied climate. If you go from really humid to really dry, you'll probably experience a little more movement. But if you keep this uh, upper back cradle within a couple inches from the top, you'll never see any movement in this and it'll look consistent over the years and that's it so that's simple now I put these screws in the back as opposed to the front because the cradles not too wide and that's a little bit more uh, sightly a little bit better looking than having them go in through the top the screws in the bottom will be hidden and so the only screws we'll really see from the front are those all right, so I, I pointed out that this thing here is already slanted. Uh, this is a pre-cut piece, and it's pre-cut at that five degree, I'm sorry, six degree. This is a six degree taper. And this is our very back piece, which is also pre-cut at that six degree taper. And then we have the individual slats. The individual slats are all long, and they're designed to have a one eighth inch um, gap between them. If you find you've built your chair and one eighth inch is a bit wide, no problem. Make the gap a little bit smaller. Won't hurt a thing. And so we're going to gap them all the way up to this point. But you see, this front one isn't going to fit between the chair. So I can't really get a gap in there because the arm of my chair is kind of in the way. So we'll just pause there for a moment. And I'm going to trace the bottoms of these so we can take them and cut them off. You can cut them off with a circular saw, jigsaw, or chop saw. I'm gonna use my chop saw since I've got it all set up over there. And these are at six degrees, so I can just set the chop saw at six degrees and make it nice and easy. Now, these ones, you'll notice I couldn't get that front one, uh, the, one the one in front of this to fit. This, I couldn't slide that forward because there was no gap. And so I clearly can't put the one in front of that in either. So if I take this one and yeah, I know that one more seat slat goes, I can line them up to one another and I can just hand draw in the frontmost slat, the one that goes right between the chair legs. It's not the front piece, which is wider, but it is the frontmost slat of these slats of this width. And that's it. So now they're all marked, and I can take them over to the chop saw and cut them. So I'll set the chop saw to six degrees on one side, and I'll cut all the slats on that side first. Then we'll flip the saw to six degrees on the other side and cut all the slats on the other side. And in reality, this probably would be faster with a circular saw because I could line all these lines up and just make one slice and do them all at once. Anytime you're doing projects in bulk, like if you have a stack of chairs to build for clients, it's always best to think about what you're doing and try to lay these things out in assembly line fashion and minimize your time so that you can maximize your productivity. And that's exactly what I'm going to do for the next step is I've just lined up all these ends of the seat slats and I'm just going to hold them together real snug, use my palm router and route over all of the ends at once. It's going to be a lot faster than trying to do them individually. And we'll just flip it around to the other side and do the same on that side. 
The more I got into this video, the more I realized that there are just millions of different things I could talk about in terms of making money. And I, I guess what I, I ended up focusing mostly on the quality of the build, the detail of the build, and how that's relevant. And I also think that building a project like an Adirondack chair or like an outdoor end table are great ways to make a lot of money. Everybody's always in the market for things like this, homeowners that is, of course. Um, and so I've kind of focused more on detail-oriented stuff, but I'm definitely available for other questions if anybody has them. In fact, we have several Patreon members. If you're not a Patreon member and you've considered supporting the channel that way, I spend a lot of time with people who are Patreon members going over details and helping them get their business going. And I just do that for all Patreon members. And I'll include my Patreon link in the description below in case there's interest. Oh, and I've got to mention, if you use Pinafin or any sort of a stain or thinner or finish on a rag, let it dry flat and preferably outdoors before you put it away or it will catch fire. Okay, back to the chair. So we have all the pieces cut, the edges are routered, we stained them, and I've got my spacers in place. These are 1 8 inch spacers. And notice here there's no spacer. That's because of the curve of the chair, the bottom of these two slats are actually touching. So we let the top act as the spacer itself. It just looks like there's a spacer there, but there isn't required to have one going in there. Okay, so here again, we're going to do the same thing we did for the back slats. We're going to drill with a countersink first, and then we're going to use a wider drill bit. That's this guy right there. And make it a little bit wider so we don't split it out at the end. Worst thing we can do, we're so close to finishing this project at the end here, we don't want that split. And you don't want to ever give a customer a project that's got splits on it. Uh, it just makes a, makes a big difference if everything you give to them looks as good as possible. So we're going to just put these in all the way across. I'm going to touch each board and kind of align it by hand with the two legs first. Make sure it's centered perfectly between the two legs. And then drill it with the countersink. Then drill it with a wider bit. And then insert the screw. Here I am using three inch deck screws because they go into a pretty wide piece of wood down below. And then when we're all done, we'll go ahead and pull the spacers out. Expect the spacers to be tight. Sometimes when you screw these things down around curves, these boards get a little tighter than they were when you first put them in. And that's a quick glance at the chair and what it kind of looks like when it's completed. But we're going to do something extra with this Adirondack chair. Adirondack chairs are often heavy and cumbersome and a little bit difficult to move around and it's just nice if you can move them around easily. So we're going to put wheels on ours. So I'm going to use a hole saw. We're going to cut a little round disc and if you cut part way through, flip it and then cut the other way through, it makes the disc come out of the hole saw pretty easily. Um, there'll be, if you need a hole saw, I'll put a link to this in the description. And of course the wheels are optional. You don't have to put wheels on this, but it is marked on the template and on the plans exactly where the hole location for the wheel goes. So we just cut the round disc out. And then I like to sand it and give the top a little bit of a round over. And then we're gonna widen that hole up a little bit. And then now that I'm looking at this, I'm realizing that's probably not the safest way to do it. Um, it's best to put this, uh, this little piece of wood in a clamp and then drill it so it doesn't spin away from you. But we'll widen that hole up to the size that's needed for this, which is an eight millimeter hole. And that's a mark that I transferred over from the plan, from the template. And I'll kind of hold that piece of wood there to make sure I'm drilling straight in. Kind of be like an alignment or a collar uh, for the router or for the drill bit. And then we'll drill that hole. And that's a specified distance off of the bottom and off of the back. The reason the back is straight and the bottom is straight is because when you tilt the chair up, it uh, the wheels engage. And we got a washer on the outside of this bolt. It's an eight millimeter bolt. It's because I used four inch scooter wheels. I think they're 100 millimeter scooter wheels. So eight millimeter was the size of the axle needed for it. So I used that for a bolt. I put some CA glue on the front of this. And then I'm going to spray um, accelerator onto the piece of wood. The oil has dried so this will hold but even if this came loose it'd make no difference at all. This is just a just a spacer just kind of acts like a wide washer. Doesn't make any difference. And then I've got a washer on the inside. So you do have to have a washer on either side of the wheel because the washer has to make contact with the bearing. And I'll put the wheel on 
and then we'll put a washer on the other side of that. And then I've got two nuts. I've got a regular nut, regular hex nut, and this, this particular nut here is a nylock. So the regular nut goes on first. We'll spin that down tight and I'll hold the hold the bolt with my uh, wrench and we'll just spin this down till that engages. That works. Make sure we do have free spin, which is good. It means the washer is right size. Now I'll put this nylon lock, lock nut, nylon locking nut or nylock nut on. And this is going to prevent this thing from uh, uh, coming loose in the future. It kind of just acts like a lock washer. And we'll just put that on there and that's it. That's all it takes to get the wheels on. And <clears throat> I'll show you what, how this works here is the the wheels won't ever make contact with the ground. They're a couple of millimeters shy, a sixteenth of an inch or, or so shy of the ground. So they're, the chair isn't going to slide around or anything when it's sitting in normal, uh, in its normal position with all four legs on the ground. And then we'll do the same thing on the other side, tighten it down. And that's it. So this chair is officially complete, 100% done. And the wheels make it so easy to move around. Um, a big heavy chair is just effortless. Uh, just two fingers, it balances perfectly. You tilt it back, the wheels engage, and you can move it around. These are four inch diameter rubber wheels. I've put a link to these in the description down below too. They're scooter wheels, they're pretty cheap. And you know, it'll wheel over uh, grass or gravel or driveway or just wherever you want to put them. Um, they're pretty rugged. And it just will help you get your chairs in place if you have to move them. And that's that. So that completes the chair. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Uh, remember, plans and uh, templates both available in the description down below. And thanks for watching.